and we have closed captions. So welcome everybody. This is our discussion with Jeremy Lent. Today, I'm Georgia Kelly, the Director of Praxis Peace Institute. And we are very happy to have Jeremy back with us because we have spoken to him when he, with both of his books, The Patterning Instinct and The Web of Meaning. And I'm kind of gonna, my initial questions, I wanna just draw a little bit out about things that were in both of the books that I think are very important to um, just look at before we get into a deeper discussion. And one is you were saying that worldviews shape the values and the values shape history. I think this is such an important piece to understand that, uh, is there anything you would like to say about that before we move on to this relationship between values, worldview and history? Sure, yeah, <laughs> and I, I agree with you, George. I think that is sort of fundamental to all of my work. And it's something that is, to me, it seems so obvious, but it is not actually recognized um, so well in most sort of mainstream thinking about history and how, uh, how culture shifts and all that stuff. So, you know, in, in like looking historically, the dominant idea is this idea of sort of geographical determinism that things happen the way they are just because Europe happened to be a certain way and they happened to find the United, find the, the new worlds before China. And, and what my, <clears throat> what that, that first book, The Patterning Instinct shows is that actually that's not the case that in fact, the way that cultures make sense of the world affects what they do and affects what they think is the norm and so how to act. And so, you know, you see how China was way more powerful than any European civilization um, around the time when Columbus uh, found the new world. But China had this fleet that went all over Africa and the Middle East, but they never conquered these places to try to mine the gold mines and all that stuff because they didn't even think in that way. They brought ambassadors back to China to count out to the emperor and they maintained uh, sort of peace throughout the whole Indian Ocean because they had a different way of thinking about uh, the universe. And our, really our modern history is the story, the last few hundred years of the unfolding of this worldview of exploitation and extraction and domination and conquest that um, we now take, we now sort of think, oh, that must be how humans are because it's become global. But it was actually very specific to this European way of thinking. I mean, sure, there were emperors like the Genghis Khans of the world bef um, before the Europeans who uh, wanted to conquer and, and create empires and all that stuff. But the Europeans had a particular way of looking at all of nature and all other people other human beings as this resources to exploit in the maximum way. And that's now become our worldview. And that's why the important thing about that phrase, you know, culture, culture shapes values, values shape history, is that then when we apply that today, we recognize that our values, our dominant values today will shape the future, which is why when we're looking at political change that we need, at climate breakdown, all these things, we have to realize that it's not enough to try to change the technologies. It's not enough even to try to change the policies, but we have to look at the shift in values that's needed to move into a different direction. This is, this is a very hard thing to actually do when you're talking about populations of people shifting values. We can have groups of people who shift their values, and we've certainly right. had a lot of the speakers who are doing that in, in this series, but to actually change the values in a culture when so many people think that's just the way the world is, or like you point out in your books, the selfish gene that Dawkins talks about, uh, and this kind of reductionist thinking that um, sees things in black and white, things have always been the way. Oh, just a second. Okay, I just had to mute that person. Um, Anyway, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, or have you talk a little bit about the reductionism that's been part of our culture and our thinking and um, what the ideas that Dawkins have had, why they've gotten so much uh, press compared to, to thinking like yours. Why is this and what can we do to change it? Oh, I just had to, I was just unmuting myself there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I think, that um, <clears throat> partly this whole reductionist worldview is really has been the dominant worldview for centuries. And so there have been systems thinkers for over a hundred years who've been talking about 
how we need to see the world <clears throat> in a very different way, in a more holistic way. Even around this time of the Renaissance, there was Leonardo da Vinci, who had an incredibly uh, complex uh, systems-oriented way of looking at things. But because it wasn't dominant, um, it wasn't part of this kind of um, way, the fundamental way that we inherited that Chris, from Christianity and Christianity inherited from the ancient Greeks. Um, these things, these ideas haven't really gained much traction in the West. So uh, really this, the theory of evolution itself is part of this kind of reductionist, um, or, or at least it got kind of hijacked in a way by the reductionist way of thinking. The theory of evolution itself is not reductionist in the slightest, but um, the way people looked at it, and then, then they, I, they identified the gene, and then Dawkins came up with this idea of the selfish gene, was it um, kind of transformed the theory to suggest that we're all, that everything in nature is a separate individual competitive agent. And it's no coincidence that this just happens to be the same ideology as sort of neoliberalism. Um, because, I mean, Richard Dawkins wrote this book actually in 1976, and you kind of captured the zeitgeist so that, you know, you had in the 80s, just with the first, the first wave of the sort of neoliberal takeover. And you remember that movie, Wall Street, where you have Gordon Gecko um, standing up and he's, he's the hero, um, the sort of hedge fund trader trying to take over some, uh, uh, some company so he can uh, lay all, all the employees off and restructure it and all that stuff. And he stands there and says, basically, greed is good. You know, this is the this is the evolutionary spirit, and humans have done better job than anybody in being greedy. And that's why it's not just that um, it's successful, but it's the right thing to do. So there's this kind of way in which that became uh, the um, sort of underpinning for people to say it's not just I'm not just selfish because I'm a you know, I, I'm a horrible, selfish bastard. I'm actually doing the right thing. Um, and this has worked for the best benefit of everybody. So this, this very powerful ideology that is not just dangerous and driving us to destruction, but it's plain wrong. And that's what um, a lot of what this new book I, um, that came out this year, The Web of Meaning, is trying to do is to show that actually it's um, what modern science tells us is the exact opposite of all these things. In fact, the great... Um, steps forward in evolution. Ever since life began billions of years ago on Earth, there's only been like five or six major evolutionary steps. It raises in complexity and the abundance of life on Earth. Every one of those came about through different, actual, um, different organisms, different species, learning how to work together, learning that if they applied their specialties um, and actually did it in mutually beneficial symbiosis with other entities, everyone could be better off. Um, and that's actually what we find from evolution. Um, and similarly, humans, um, what, what differentiates us from other primates is precisely that we're not um, these kind of selfish, competitive, um, sort of male dominant, uh, sort of alpha males type, whatever. The, there, there is that, that element within humanity that we share with other uh, with other primates, but what separates humanity is that millions of years ago, we learned, our, our hominid ancestors learned to cooperate with each other and learned that those groups that cooperated were more successful. Right. Well, I'm going to open it up for a minute, but there was something that you mentioned in your book that I thought would be interesting to people to, to hear you talk about, um, and that is that if children learn self-discipline in the first decade of their life, that it predicts their success later on. And I'd like you to just say something about that and then I'll open it up. Yeah, well, that's, um, that is an interesting uh, sort of part of the, um, uh, uh, basically what, what science has come to show. And I actually, I don't call it self-discipline, but it's more a matter of like self-regulation mm -hmm. that um, it's something around, uh, when what, what their studies have, have shown is that those children who learn to regulate their impulses actually do tend to be more successful um, and also less prone to drug abuse or um, you know, or, or, or all kinds of negative things. And um, what I 
sort of show in the book is that it, it kind of leads the way to develop what I call an integrated consciousness, that we as humans actually have two different elements to our consciousness. We have the, the same kind of animate consciousness that we share with all other mammals, that in fact, at a deeper layer that we share with all of life. And we have that within us. And then we do have a very specific and uniquely human way of a sort of symbolic conceptual way of looking at the world. And it's when we use that, um, th that different way of thinking, that self-awareness to actually harmonize with our animate consciousness, we can actually be the most happiest, fulfilled as people and, and successful in the world. And we can apply that to civilization as a whole, that really I think the only way that we actually have a potential to shift our direction to a true symbiotic relationship with the whole living earth is to actually develop a collective harmonized consciousness, to take our technologies, to take all the brilliance that humanity can, um, can put together, but to turn that towards reintegrating with our animate intelligence and with the deep animate intelligence of all of life. And if we can turn that around in that way, we, we have the ability as sort of part of Gaia being self-aware to actually have a, a long and successful future uh, on this planet, I think. Great, well, one of the things that I know you wanna talk about today is what happened with COP26 in Glasgow. Um, and I know that people probably want, is anyone, if anyone wants to ask, well, I've got a hand up already from Fran Corton. Okay, so Fran, I'm gonna ask you to, to unmute. Fran? So Jeremy, I am one of your huge fans and have read every single word and underlined both of your books. Um, and I am actually going to use a lot of your uh, fundamental ideas as the basis for a um, sermon at my church. And uh, it's about kind of the what I'm going to call the emerging worldview. Mm -hmm. So in George's opening statement, she quoted you as saying worldview shapes the values and values shape history. So then you went on to comment about how values shape history. But I wanna hone in on how worldview shapes values. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about that? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, um, basically the way in which worldview shapes values is because our worldview is actually very, it's an interesting thing because it's profoundly important in how it affects our lives, but we're not really aware of it. Exactly. And like in, in one of my books, I use the idea of like a fish swimming in water. And mm -hmm. um, everything the fish does is in water, but that fish doesn't even realize it's in water because that's all it knows. And similarly, like we can think of the worldview a little bit like um, another analogy is like the lens through which we see the world. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, we need a biologist to tell us that we actually have a lens in our eye. We don't realize that. We just see the world the way it is. Um, and so a worldview is something that um, infants develop from the earliest, uh, uh, as soon as they kind of learn language and they look at what's going on around them, they kind of see these are the norms. These are the way in which I make sense of things. These are the way in which um, I flourish within my community, within my family, my community, and everything else. It's not like something where... And the sort of parent takes the kid at age nine and says, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to sit you down on my lap now. Here's what we believe. We, this is what is right. This is what's wrong. So it's just deeply inculcated. And that's where, um, val it, that's where it has such a deep impact on values. For example, if we think that nature is a resource, doesn't actually have um, a true intrinsic value to itself, that it's just a machine, which is what our dominant worldview tells us, then there's obviously there's clearly there's nothing wrong with um, going and sort of doing like um, clear, clearing mountaintops to get a, the coal more efficiently, as long as you you know make sure it's sustainable so the next generation can clear the next mountaintop. Like there's nothing wrong with that if you don't believe that other animals have sentience and feelings like humans do. Then factory farming, like basically torturing billions of animals a year just for our convenience. Um, should be okay. Uh, but when you have a different worldview and recognize that every living creature has sentience, has intrinsic sacredness and value, these things become the, some of the most horrendous crimes that um, have ever been committed on this earth. So, so it completely changes the values by which we look at normal at behaviors all around us. Very good. 
<laughs> Those examples are great. I, I would love even more. <laughs> well, you know, Sam Keen always says that um, you're, you're born with the hardware, but as soon as you're born, they start shoving in the software to how you're going to think and what you're going to believe. And I, I've never forgotten that because that's exactly what happens as you start growing up, you have this environment that tells you what reality is, right. uh, that tells you what you should believe. And it's yeah. the myths of our culture. And we don't see them as myths. We see them that, as reality. You know, and that's a great quote, Georgia, because if you take that analogy of the hardware and the software, mm -hmm. um, we can think of our worldview as the operating system. Right. So it's somewhere, it's not the actual hardware, but it underlies all of the software. And mm -hmm. so only some software works on that operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and the operating it's system like leads naturally to ways of doing things that you wouldn't even think of if you had a different operating system. Right. Yeah, that we see what we expect to see and not other, other than that, right. unless we really get opened somehow. So I think David, Corton, you want to ask something. You want to yeah, Jer Jeremy, I, you, <laughs> every time I hear you, you just blow my mind. Um, and of course, you're talking about the same things I devote my life to trying to understand, and you do it so much better than I do. I sort of feel I can easily retire and just leave it to you. Um, the thing that puzzles me a little bit, however, um, I'm currently very focused on this framing around an ecological civilization and the human transition to an ecological civilization. And you wrote the lead article on that for Yes, and I know you're going to your next book. Uh, that's the title. Um, so far in your present today presentation today, you've never mentioned the word. Um, why is that? Oh yeah, to me, um, I this is absolutely fundamental and <clears throat> really the only. It, it's as if we had just been talking about the operating system, changing the operating system. That is my very analogy for an ecological civilization. That if we can name the old operating system and our dominant worldview, it's basically mm -hmm. um, wealth accumulation or extraction, whatever the name we want to come up with. The name of the new operating system, in my view, is ecological civilization. So um, I feel that's, that's what it's about. It's about shifting um, uh, the fundamental way in which we look at our society from one that is all about accumulating wealth and says that that is the right thing to do and then an institution should be built on that way to a society that is based that is on based on life affirming values that's basically that's based on setting the conditions for the long term flourishing of all humans on a regenerated living earth and 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 to me that is what once you shift the worldview from that reductionist worldview to a worldview of deep interconnectedness, that it just naturally arises. And it just like sort of organically comes out of that because that's the only real sensible way to try to organize society once you change that basis. Beautiful. Okay, are there questions? If not, I want to go to the COP26 um, UN conference that took place in Glasgow, because I know Jeremy would like to say something about that. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, I wrote um, an article right before COP26, um, not exactly trying to predict it, even though it was very predictable what was going to happen, but um, figuring that no matter what, um, what happens in COP26, the whole conversation around it is their own conversation. Um, and basically the, the title of the article <clears throat> was um, something like uh, um, <clears throat> the end of capitalism is required to solve the climate crisis or um, something like that. Um, because the only way in which we can really look properly at the climate crisis is to recognize what that we have to shift this system fundamentally. And what happens is even the so many of the people who are, you know, doing good work on climate and really <clears throat> trying with the best intentions and clear commitment to positive outcomes to kind of try to make incremental improvements and focus on whatever is divestment from fossil fuels and investment in renewables and all that stuff. 
Um, what they're missing is that as long as you make these changes within the capitalist system, any efficiencies you come up with, any improvements you come up with, automatically gets used by capitalism to just um, then exploit and consume even more. And I, I write in this article about <clears throat> this um, famous economic insight, actually from the 19th century, called the Jevons Paradox, um, that was discovered actually by a, a British economist called Jevons, who looked at the invention of the steam engine. Um, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And what is ironic is that the steam engine was, de was developed. You know, we, ne we now think of it as the thing that started the, the sort of spark that started the whole Industrial Revolution. It was developed to actually make mining more efficient, to use less coal, because <clears throat> they had these really lousy engines to try to pump water out of the coal mines. And um, so James Watt came up with this more efficient way so you could use less coal to pump the same amount of water out of the coal mine. And so it was this efficient improvement, um, which instead, as soon as people saw how, oh, wow, we can use this and then we can mine even more coal and then we can use this energy to make even more steel. And then we can, so every time there's an improvement, it makes even more. So um, even if you can move towards renewable energy within the capitalist system, then people will go, great, now we don't need to worry about um, so many emissions um, from, from the actual energy we use. Now we can just use this renewable energy to mine, uh, you know, mine other minerals and we can use it to consume even more. And people always find more ways to use this energy within the capitalist system, which is why uh, the fundamental system has to be changed if we're going to actually move in a different direction. So basically you're saying nothing is gonna happen uh, environmentally without this systemic changes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wouldn't, I don't want to say, uh, nothing. But, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't say that because I really we need. encourage and support all the great work that is being done because incremental work is super important. Mm -hmm. um, but my point is that when that incremental work is done within the context of capitalism, it will tend to be subverted right. and end up not having the effect that people want. And we've seen that over and over again. I mean, I think of some of the um, uh, discoveries or inventions that were supposed to save humanity from, well, Actually, one was supposed to feed the world. That was DDT. Uh -huh. DDT was going to feed the world because it was going to kill all the pests and there'd be enough food for everybody. That didn't quite work out. And it worked out exactly the way you're talking about. Um, exactly, Georgia. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So it's, there's, yeah. it happens over and over and over again. The internet mm -hmm. was another one of these inventions and look right. how it's been used. So exactly. I think you know what you're saying is absolutely <laughs> correct. And it's just understanding how difficult it will be to get that shift in values and worldview. Yeah. We're, we're up against yeah. that. And um, let's, let's maybe explore that a, 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 a little bit in a few minutes, but I want to hear what Fran um, is, uh, She's is, next. is wanting to ask before we do that. <clears throat> oh, oh, okay, you want to do, okay. Fran, do you want to uh, unmute? Fran, I think you're still muted. Yeah, Fran. Okay. So I'd just like to come back. You keep using this word reductionist. And right. I'd like to understand exactly what you mean by it. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, well, basically, reductionism <clears throat> is really a um, methodology that was actually first developed by Descartes back in the 17th century. And it was a brilliant um, uh, methodology that he came up with. He basically was looking at the world and said, you know, if we can um, <clears throat> break it down into smaller and smaller parts and then study each part really well, we can understand it better. And let's like start a whole project, <clears throat> a whole, uh, sort of a scientific project to do that in all different areas. Um, and it took off. And it was, um, it was kind of like the, the internet <laughs> of, of the 17th century. It was a brilliant idea that inspired people. Um, and it was part, it was one of the fundamental methodologies underlying the scientific revolution. And, meth and reductionism has been phenomenally successful. It's what has led us to <clears throat> understand how biology works with cells and genes and how um, <clears throat> chemistry works with molecules and how physics works all the way down to subatomic particles. And it's because of reductionism as a methodology that 
we can speak to each other over thousands of miles, that we have the, the germ theory of disease. I mean, so many wonderful things have come from it that I, I view myself as just a great fan of reductionism as a methodology. Where it begins to go wrong is so many scientists have been so taken by the success of, of reductionism that they say, this explains not just a lot of stuff, but it explains everything. It explains the entire universe. And not just that, but it's the only way to explain everything in the universe. So they make these two leaps of faith that it's the only way that works and it explains every single thing in the universe. And that's what I call in my, in my book actually, ontological reductionism. The word ontological means, you know, re relating to the basic understanding of existence itself. And that's the, the another way of saying it as uh, I think Stuart Kaufman writes this, it's like, um, he has this lovely phrase, nothing buttery, which basically refers to reductionists often say, everything is nothing but this or that. So um, <clears throat> a biologist will say, evolution is nothing but uh, selfish genes attacking, you, yeah, out competing each other. Or um, a, a neurologist or a psychologist might say, our consciousness is nothing but um, um, you know, neurons interacting with each other in this ways. But it's more than that. And there's this whole other very scientifically valid, coherent way of looking at the world, which you can encapsulate as systems theory, if you will, yes. um, which looks at things from a different perspective. And it doesn't reject reductionism. It says reductionism is all well and good. And building on that, we can look at the world and we can look at the connections between things and re recognize that when you look at those connections between things, it leads to emergent new ways of understanding them. And you begin to discover this principle that exists at a higher level of scale that you need to understand a system at a higher level that aren't simply, um, and it's not enough to know those principles at the lower level of scale. And that's basically, once you start to apply that way to looking at the world, things begin to look very different. And that's basically uh, a lot of what the web of meaning is about it. It shows that that way of looking at things breaks down these barriers. So rather than having this separation between what's spiritual and the material world that reduction, that ontological reductionism claims, we see that actually um, there is no separation, that we can recognize that the connections between things lead us to a far more spiritual and values oriented way of relating to the world. Thank you. I think, uh, Katie, did you want to ask something? Katie? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Katie. Thanks, Jeremy. Truly an honor. I feel like I'm sitting here with Einstein. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, all right. So I imagine a lot of us here understand that this unified field is here, and we understand that it's possible to change the paradigm, to change this value system. Um, this worldview of interconnectedness. I, I also read your book. I, I try I, twice, but I'm st I need to read it five more times. Um, but I'm just going to use a simple example that you used: the uh, the suffering of animals. Mm -hmm. So you take uh, that example. So now the SPCA has pictures of animals all over TV about how they're suffering, right? or at least we see those here and they're chained and they need help and they need donations. Yeah. And still the amount of empathy and connectedness that's needed collectively for people to really care about animals is pretty much non-existent or small, minimal. So my question is how can each of us in this group propel the, um, I, I don't prefer ecological civilization because I think many people won't re really feel the, it, the, the resonance of that, but the, the uh, worldview of deep interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Yes, <clears throat> um, and I think what you're asking is just how each of us can actually <clears throat> try to instill that worldview in those around us. And that's a key, a key question. Um, and it's one thing to, you know, write a book and try to put these ideas out there. <clears throat> but as 
you know, I think we all we all know people's minds don't actually change yes. through their <clears throat> through ideas being argued. I right. mean, if they did, we'd all agree about uh, that <laughs> we, we're dealing with climate breakdown. Or, um, I mean, and what we see more again and again <clears throat> is, and such studies have actually been done that actually people who are better educated are the ones who are even least susceptible to new ideas because they oh. use their left brain thinking and their sort of um, their way of making sense of things to then find more and more convoluted arguments against the very thing that you're trying to persuade them about. So it has to start with the heart, basically. And that actually comes uh, <clears throat> a little bit to watch where I was going to go um, with Georgia just a few minutes ago about the difficulties <clears throat> in shifting values. Um, <clears throat> because I think where, where we need to begin um, is connecting with people's hearts that naturally want to connect empathically and compassionately with the rest of the world. And this is our secret weapon in my mind. Um, the absolute, the powerful secret weapon that we have against the corporations, against the militaries, and against all these things is all these different forces have to suppress our core humanity. And, and what they basically, the only way they can work <clears throat> is they can have to take little infants as soon as they're sort of old enough to watch the screen on the, on the iPhone or the TV or whatever, and start to condition them to learn not to be who they really are and who they really want to grow into being. And, and well, they've done a, a damn good job of this, of course, but the secret weapon is to connect people back with their own humanity, because every one of the 8 billion people in the world today <clears throat> has that beating heart and has that desire for love and connectedness and to feel good about who they are in the community and to connect with nature and all those things. Many <clears throat> have become numbed and have had to sort of, have had to learn to suppress those instincts so much that they don't even know they even have them in some cases, or they might relate to them in weird and warped ways. But what we have is the ability to connect people with that. So if we're <clears throat> looking at <clears throat> say um, somebody let's just say who's a meat eater and we're trying to get them to go vegetarian or whatever. Well, one way to do it is look at, at how they're sort of stroking their pets, you know, their, their pet dog or cat, and oh, I so love them and, and say, isn't that funny how, you know, they, we love this beautiful dog, but there's a, but like a pig who's actually every bit as intelligent and, and sweet and lovely, we're, 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 we're about to eat for dinner tonight. Isn't that strange? And rather than make them feel bad and make them feel they've got to defend themselves and they're bad people and, and, then, and then cause all these rationalizations, to put these questions <clears throat> into people's minds, let them just feel it for themselves. I think as soon as people feel defensive, they're being told they're on the wrong side, they're doing something wrong, they close down, they clam up. As soon as they feel curious and alive and start to explore their own way of, of meaning making and start to re realize just one little part of that lens through which they're seeing the world, almost like see a little bit of a scratch in it. And then they begin to realize, oh, there's actually a lens through which I'm seeing the world because I see that scratch. It sort of it gets people to be more aware and then start to ask further questions. Very good. Um, Rocky, I think we, you're the next question. Uh, it's Linda, and okay. I guess, yeah, I, I love your work, Jeremy. It's it's so in line with the work I do. Um, so for me, to change one's value sets um, is very related to worldview, as you said. And I, I follow the work of David Bohm. I don't think you mentioned David Bohm in your- No, in your no, actually. Um, but do you know his work? Yes, I know his work, but not well enough that I feel I can quote it and I could have used okay. it as material in my book. So I, I've come across it, but I'm, I'm far from real being an expert in it. But it looks, it looks, seems very profound. And I well, recognize the, over, the, inter, the, yeah, inter the, the interconnection between your work and his work is, yes. is like beautiful. So uh, I, guess, I guess my question then, since you're not familiar with his work, I mean, how I, I've come to see that it's through how we communicate with others right. that we change our worldview, because if we have ways of suspending our judgment and we have ways of, as you said, entering into a curious um, place where we run into difference with others, but we are simply curious about it. We're not defending ourselves. We're simply curious about, you know, how, how does 
your worldview versus my worldview, you know, uh, how, how does that come together? It seems to work well. So I guess I'm just curious, how do you see a worldview being changed directly? I mean, I, you know, with, with David Bohm, of course, he has a quantum worldview, which is based on science, mm -hmm. which is very, for, from a Western point of view, um, for me anyways, it really was helpful. And, and it's also very in line with Eastern ways of knowing. So I don't know, I, I guess I'm just curious, like what is the most direct path for you to changing worldview? Yes, I think um, <clears throat> the way that I, I sort of think about worldviews <clears throat> and also um, most importantly, the changes in worldviews is from this perspective of looking at complex systems. And we can really look at our whole um, modern culture, our global culture as being an incredibly complex system, most definitely. And the thing about complex systems is one is that they work in non-linear ways. Yes. Um, and so um, when, because if we just kind of look linearly where we're going, it's like, forget about it. <laughs> we, we, it's like things are just sort of, we're just heading directly to, for the cliff. But the, the hope um, for, the trans, for the transformation comes from re recognizing this nonlinear aspect of them. And the fact that this nonlinearity can happen at layers deep below what we are necessarily aware of. So um, one great analogy is like the sort of mycorrhizal fungal network that you see in a forest where, as we, as we now know from biologist Suzanne Simard and others, um, trees in a forest are actually all communicating to each other um, through their root network, connecting with this mycorrhizal fungal web, this incredibly profound web all through the forest. And they're actually not just communicating, but transmitting uh, resources to each other and all this stuff through that. But when you're walking through the forest, you don't even know there's a mycorrhizal fungal web. You just look at the tree and you see the leaves and, <clears throat> that, and your sense is that's all there is. And so similarly, when I mean, each day I, uh, I, I sort of look online at the, at the newspapers and the, the news, and that's like the, the trees. That's the stuff you see every day. The news headlines talks about Trump this and that and the Republican Party doing that and um, you know, um, all this sort of horrendous stuff that is enough to discourage anybody. All you got to read basically is one day's headlines to feel that. But what you don't read in those news headlines is things like, you know, millions of people today were <clears throat> connecting with each other um, <clears throat> in different kinds of ways and relating to each other <clears throat> about the climate <clears throat> and becoming aware um, of a shift in uh, the sort of being more connected with others all around the world. And you don't see anything like that until, for example, something like the murder of George Floyd happens. And then you suddenly see an outpouring, not just in the United States, but all around the world of millions of people coming on the streets and saying, this is unacceptable and we're going to, um, we need changes to happen. Um, now, many of these events, whether it's uh, the reaction to George Floyd or the reaction to Greta Thunberg's, um, where you, you sort of get millions of, of uh, kids all around the world in a school children's strike, some of them tend to, we can look at them and say, oh, well, that looked really powerful for a while, and then it petered out. Um, and that's absolutely right. But when you look at phase transitions in complex systems, that's exactly what the signal, the warning signs are when a phase transition is about to happen. Um, the system tends to, tends to sort of go from one extreme to the other quite quickly, and it'll, and you'll see a shift and it'll go back to the more sort of normal system that was there before. And you'll see a shift and it'll go back again. But the point is that as you see more and more of these shifts, the system is getting closer and closer to a true phase transition. None of us know if that's the case, but what we can know is that the impact each of us can have in actually um, allowing that phase transition to happen is to try to make sure that we are putting our energy and our connections into that system in the way that amplifies the change as much as possible. And I think there are some uh, specifics that go around that. It's not just some sort of um, uh, philosophical statement or whatever. I mean, one way to amplify change as much as possible is to focus not just on what each of us is working on, but on how we can amplify the work that others around us are working on. And you know, to really ask ourselves, am I spending 
And if I'm spending more time on just what I'm doing and almost no time on what others are doing, then maybe um, I'm not actually being as effective as I can be in, in affecting that change. And another equally important level of that is to make sure the quality with which we are having any conversation, could be a conversation over Christmas time with our family, it could be with a neighbor, it could be a political conversation, whatever, that we're doing it out of a sense of that deep connectedness, that we're doing it out of a sense of true love and caring for the other person, even if we see them as being political opponents or whatever that might be. Because as soon as we start to other the other side and say, they're the bad people, they're the ones we need to overcome, we're actually giving more energy to that worldview of separation. We're giving more energy to that other side than to the transformation that we need. I'm going to go to David Corden, but I wanted to just bring up something as you talked about the headlines that we see every day. And when I moved this summer, I decided to get rid of my television. I wasn't using it that much anyway, but um, I got rid of it. But I still see all these headlines on the, the news things that I see online and they're horrific. It's like, they don't talk about cooperation humbled. They talk about all the horrible things going on in the world. And it's like, how much of that can we take in without it becoming overwhelming, a distraction, um, all of that? Uh, it just seems like at, there's a certain point where we have to just shut it off. And I just wanted to get your opinion on that. And then we're going to go to David Corey. Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, you know, I actually <clears throat> think the best opinion I've come across on that is actually uh, from Rutger Bregman, who wrote a wonderful oh, book last it. year, um, Humankind, where he does a great job. Uh, far more extensively than I've done in my own book. And his whole book is, is on this to show how this whole notion of humans as being selfish is just bunk. And he does it in a beautiful way. And I recommend that book to anybody who hasn't yet read it. But uh, early on in his book, in this book, he talks about studies um, looking at people um, reading news versus people not reading news. And it's one of the most um, effective ways to actually get to have high cortisol levels, to actually feel very negative and to have a very negative view of human beings in society is to actually read the news. And people who take uh, like long vacations uh, from reading the news um, tend to have a far more positive view about human beings um, and about life in general and about themselves than, um, than, we, than we read the news. It's a little bit like taking a, um, like a poison really every day, um, which I do. And I feel the need to do that to sort of stay engaged with the world. So um, I'm, uh, I'm not saying that one shouldn't do that. It's, certainly I don't feel I can afford to do that in my role, but it's something to be aware of is that reading the news does have this very negative impact on you. And in fact, something that I do before I even look at the news every morning, I do a very brief meditation. Um, where I try to ground myself. I actually started this right after Trump got elected um, because I just figured I just couldn't, I couldn't approach the news. I, I, I just didn't feel I had it in me. So I started this process of doing just a, a, a brief grounding meditation so that by the time I'm looking at the news, I'm at least coming from a little bit of a, a, a more centered, grounded place. Right. I, I find that I'm doing the puzzles on the New York Times site more <laughs> than I'm reading their news. Um, so David Gordon. Yeah, Jeremy, going back to your uh, immediately previous uh, observation, uh, I believe you called it phase shift. Um, you know, I've been very impressed that some of these human shifts can take place very quickly, mm -hmm. instantly. Um, and examples during our lifetime was the, the you know, Gandhi and the, the liberation of uh, India. Mm -hmm. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and the collapse of apartheid in South Africa. <clears throat> I'm also aware that what emerged from these was far from the kind of ideals that we're talking about. Yes. And my sense of that is that while there was this sudden shift of, yes, we can no longer tolerate this current insanity, there was no real vision of what the alternative looked like. And of course, the alternative of an ecological civilization is, is 
there's so much of it that it's obvious, and yet it is extraordinarily complex, as you have laid out. And so we can have the, the, the collapse rapidly, but that doesn't necessarily mean the emergence of the new. Yes. The other, the other thing I wanted to mention um, in terms of these systems mobilizing in unexpected ways, one of the questions in my mind is whether we are currently facing an awareness, some kind of an awareness within nature and the earth system that we humans are an enemy. And that in some ways we could think about what's happening in the natural world now as a rebellion of nature to get rid of this of offensive and abusive and enemy species. How do you think about those two issues? Yeah, well, that two two very profound <laughs> questions, David. Let's. Um, why don't I do um, the uh, talk with you about that second one first, and then come back to the the yeah. first one you were saying? And um, yeah, I, I hear what you, what you're saying. Personally, I get a little nervous about sort of anthropomorphizing um, nature, if you will. You know, like, I mean, and there have been some articles about, you know, COVID, uh, this is nature hitting back at humans for doing, doing this and that. I also get nervous about characterizing humanity itself as a species as being what is causing all of the harm on this earth, as opposed to basically our capitalist exploitative um, civilization that has now sort of set itself up in places the only as the sort of default way of organizing ourselves on the earth. If you know, because nature that looks to me like humans. Right, that's a, a very good point. So if we allow that for that anthropom anthropomorphic quality, then nature will say, yeah, this is, and I, and I, I do think that we can, um, we can take that and if we, if we look at nature as having this kind of deep animate intelligence, which I do describe in the book. And yeah. that, and if we recognize animate intelligence itself as being basically similar to human intelligence in the sense that it's this emergent process from all kinds of incredibly complex systems that cohere together. What we can understand, like if a human being um, responds, uh, if, if someone sort of attacks a human being and they fit, hit back, basically what's going on is they shift back and they and they react in ways that they might not normally react in as a, as a response to what they're being hit. You might react instinctively. If you hit me in the face, I might hit you back without even realizing that's what I'm doing as an instinctive reaction. So similar, I think what we can say is that we, um, in our civilization is massively destabilizing the coherence of natural ecosystems. Um, and we're doing that in all kinds of um, ways like the what's called the Columbian exchange, you know, where we um, take um, organisms and species from one part of the world, bring them to other parts of the world through sort of globalized trade or whatever. We also do that through the very destruction of environments as well as of course, um, through climate breakdown. So many different ways in which we are um, essentially disintegrating nature. And when nature gets sort of disintegrated, it loses that coherence. And when it loses that coherence, all kinds of, of weird and bizarre elements in what, what had a very a, a, a good place to play as a small element within a much larger system suddenly become the major players in some ecosystem and start to destroy it. So we see that with things like dead zones in the oceans. Um, and we see that with things like COVID. And so, and we see that in climate breakdown. So it's, I mean, if we want to anthrop anthropomorphize and say basically um, Gaia has been, it's getting under attack from humans. And why I would hesitate to ascribe intentionality like a human uh, sort of conscious intention of saying, well, I'm gonna get those humans back by bringing climate change on them or COVID or whatever. The end result is the same. And the process is very similar because these complex systems are, as they get fragmented, they come up in all these weird and disastrous ways, just like this um, fungus, which is now wiping out frog species across the world, uh, again, because of globalized trade, um, it's it's just causing massive destruction 
that we otherwise wouldn't be seeing. We see that in almost every element of the natural world. So I think in that respect, we can totally um, say that uh, human activities have led uh, the whole um, global ecosystem to undergo such disruptions that the end result is that it is undermining our very uh, ability to thrive on the earth. So anyway, that's a that's a kind of more geeky or long-winded way of responding to the to the uh, that idea. But ultimately, it comes to the same place I think that you were talking about. And um, yeah, sorry, Georgia. We're going to go somewhere else. Oh, and well, there was one other question right. that David yes. had. I wanted to. Yes. I didn't want to forget because yeah. one other little question, <laughs> um, which is this whole notion of the the vision that is actually needed for people to move towards and. And I do feel that's honestly speaking personally, that's why I am so excited by the vision of an ecological civilization that basically I'm ready to commit many yeah, years of my life to dedicate to putting that vision out there. Because as I see it, uh, I feel um, the attraction towards one little kind of speck of light can be so much more powerful than a recognition of all kinds of bad things all around. It's like, one, one analogy that I sometimes think is powerful is it, like, imagine if you're in a completely dark room and you're looking at a computer screen, like a big screen, which is also all the pixels on that screen are dark, except for just one or maybe two or three pixels that are bright and light. That in all this darkness, um, you're gonna be pulled and attracted just towards those pixels that are bright, because that's what will take your attention. So it, similarly, we can look at what's going on in the world right now, see all kinds of destruction, all kinds of things that are wrong. And we can come up with any number of scenarios for doom and gloom and the end of civilizations. We know it and other terrible things to come in that place. And I mean, I can tell you, I've, I've had all kinds of scenarios like that. So um, and I'm sure each of us has. But then that those few pixels of light will draw our attention. And that's where I feel like um, what, we, what is needed is to actually flesh out that vision of an ecological civilization so much so that not just it inspires um, so many millions of people around the world to work towards it, but most importantly, it allows the tens or hundreds of millions of people in the world who are already working towards it, it lets them realize that they are already doing it. And um, I mean, to me, one of the best things that I hear when I talk about ecological civilization to people is somebody says, oh, you know, I realize I'm actually I'm working towards an ecological civilization. What I'm doing, that's what I'm already doing. And I go, yes, because it's not a matter. We're not trying to um, get hundreds of millions of people to wake up to a, a new idea. We're rather letting all those people that are working towards that life affirming future realize that they're all doing it together and they're actually part of the shared umbrella and that i feel is what uh, is the power that can actually transform the system so that um, the system itself is not just lots and lots of little separate strands of positive uh, energy, but those systems then all can, can can get correlated and work together towards one fundamental shift. Right. I think we will just take one more question, and it looks like it's Fran. Fran, you want to unmute? Fran? Jeez. So, uh, Jeremy, you talk about this animate um, uh, consciousness, and then uh, another consciousness, a self uh, consciousness. Right. Yeah. So I'm. I don't know if that sits real well with me. Um, I want to talk about an octopus, right? Soul of the octopus. I love that book. So the octopus turns out to be good with tools. It's recognizes faces, it has people it likes, people it doesn't like, it's curious, it wants to approach people, it likes to be touched and touched. Is that animate consciousness or is that self-consciousness? Oh, I see, I see what you're saying. Well, um, just to <clears throat> say the, the term, the, the actual term I use 
and in the book, I call it conceptual consciousness, which um, which is one of the things that leads humans to become sort of self-aware or whatever. But right. to your point, like octopuses have an incredible, <clears throat> um, just amazing intelligence in multiple dimensions. And also they have a kind of intelligence that we can't even conceive of where every one of their tentacles has its own <laughs> identity as part of it. I mean, just totally mind blowing. Um, and then it, also uh, we know that um, other animals have passed the so-called mirror test where they recognize themselves in a mirror. And so they're aware of themselves. And some birds have um, uh, chimpanzees, elephants. I mean, so totally that self-awareness is absolutely not by any means unique to humans. Mm -hmm. What I think, um, I think the best way of looking at the relation between sort of humans and uh, an, a sort of uniquely human consciousness and those of other animals is actually described best by Franz de Waal, um, who I'm sure many of you know, he's written great books about the intelligence and empathy of other animals um, uh, all, all around the world. And he puts out this idea of like, imagine a landscape with different peaks. And so on that landscape, you might have a certain uh, peak over um, in one area, which might be a certain kind of whale or cetacean consciousness. And you might have a certain peak in another area, which might be an avian consciousness. And in each of these cases, there's a particular and um, special quality to that consciousness that is unique um, that no other animal can think or conceive of the world um, like a whale does other than a whale or, or like a dolphin or like a chimpanzee or whatever. And then humans have their own particular peak. Um, and the peak that humans have doesn't make the peak higher or better in any which way than the unique elements of others. It's just that what it has, it's, it has certain characteristics that it allows a certain kind of consciousness that maybe other animals have to some degree, but probably we humans have to a greater degree, which is this ability to conceptualize, um, which has allowed us to develop technologies that have then allowed us to basically dominate the world um, in the way that we do today. That doesn't make humans better. It does mean that humans have had more power to apply their unique form of consciousness than other, than other animals. So when I'm describing human beings, I describe the conceptual consciousness as being somewhat distinct with the animate, but a lot of what my book is about is saying that the, I mean, of course, they're also related to each other. And I think the path to uh, um, both human flourishing as well as our uh, flourishing of our species on the earth is for what I call an integrated consciousness, to integrate those two so that we recognize them as being separate, but also part of one bigger whole. And so that doesn't, uh, in any way distinguish from the incredible consciousnesses else um, that are also out there, but it just describes our human situation, I think. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much, Jer Jeremy. If, if there's anything you wanna say in conclusion, this would be the time to do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, ba basically just <clears throat> really to thank you all for engaging this conversation, it's been so alive. And so it's just been wonderful to take part in it. And, and to thank you, Georgia, for what you're doing. You know, I've been, I've been talking, as we know, a big theme of everything is this notion of this, um, change, this system change that is um, where what is required is amplifying the, all the different elements that people are working on and actually help have them help with each other. And that makes the whole system itself exponentially more powerful. And I just want to point out um, explicitly, because we all already all know that you know, so much of what you're doing, Georgia, with Praxis and, and with this whole series is exactly that. And just real gratitude to you for having that vision and actually making it realized. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. Coming, Jeremy, coming from you, that means so much to me. And, and to what we've done for the past 21 months. And as I spoke to Jeremy before we began today, one of the things I've been thinking about doing and planning to do next year is to start compiling a lot of the great ideas that have come forth through this series and the models that have been um, showcased through this series uh, and put it together in some sort of a printed uh, booklet, report, or I'm not sure what to call it yet, but that's the plan and um, I'm gonna want help with it, but I really appreciate 
what you've done, Jeremy, and how much you've been part of this. So thank yeah, you. Great. Thank you, Cortens, for being on the call too. Yeah, it's been so so great to I connect mean, with you both, Fan and David. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thank I you. I wouldn't miss this for anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and don't miss uh, Friday uh, with Andrew Cumbrell. You really want to be there from Andrew. He's another he, firebrand. He's using ecological civilization. Yes, he is. He's using that term. Yeah. Yes, he is. Wow. Yeah. Well, he used to be very close. It'll be wonderful to see him again. Oh, he's such a great creature. Georgia, yeah. can you hear me? Uh, Georgia? Who am I listening to? Oh, Ken? Ken. Yes, I can. It's Ken. Oh, good. I just figured out how to do that. I'm on my iPhone, and I'm sorry for the confusion.